Good morning, everybody. Welcome to our webinar on uh, calculating dependency claims. Uh, I'm Paul Stagg, and with me today is Lisa Doley. Uh, what we're going to do uh, is to uh, cover, um, uh, aim to give a guide, really, as to how you calculate dependency claims under the Fatal Assistance Act. Um, I'm going to deal with income dependency claims, and Lisa will, uh, and, and also multipliers, and then Lisa's going to go on to cover services dependency. Um, uh, as usual with Zoom, we have a chat section, and we also have a question and answer section, which if you click on the three dots on the right-hand side, or whatever it is if you're using a Mac, um, please, if you want to ask us a question, we are intending to try and answer some of those during the course of the seminar. And someone, some of course, is trying to call me as they would do, um, typically. So I'll just switch my phone off, if you'll just pardon me. Um, we are going to, um, uh, we'll try and answer any questions that you have during the, uh, the, uh, the webinar, but if you, if you leave, leave your email address, uh, if any we don't get to, we will endeavour to come back to you um, subsequently. Uh, so hopefully that's, that will be useful for everybody. So uh, looking at income dependency, I want rather than uh, a rather dry discussion of principles, I thought it would be helpful just to take a concrete case of moderate complexity. Uh, so what we've got is a lady called Connie who was killed in a road traffic accident at the age of 53 years ago. Um, she was married to Edward, uh, who was 55 then and is now 58 years old. Um, Edward used to work in the city, but now he's uh, working locally in an art gallery. Um, both had, uh, before Connie's untimely death, normal life expectancies. Uh, they've got two children, um, Florence, who was 15 when her mother died and now is now 18, and Seth, who was 12 and is now aged 50. So uh, a, bit more, a few more facts. Um, before she died, she was a senior manager in her organisation, earning £45,000 per annum net. Uh, uh, she had a 75% chance of promotion to director at around the time she met, it got to the age of 55, and her salary would then have gone up to 75k per annum net. Um, as uh, Edward was a company director in the city, now works in an art gallery, he's only earning 25k per annum per net now. Uh, but after, he, after his wife's death, Edward decided he needed to uh, get back to some different work, and he started a consultancy business, earning £60,000 per annum net. Um, it's thought that the children are both like to go to university locally and leave home at the age of 21. Um, their plans were that they planned to retire uh, in 12 years from the date of the trial, so 15 years from Connie's death. Uh, in terms of pensions, Connie will get about £25,000 per annum from her manager if she stays in her manager role, uh, but £40,000 per annum if she had been promoted to director and the final salary scheme that her firm operated. Um, Edward's pensions, uh, he gets a £50,000 a year pension uh, from his previous role, uh, and uh, now receives a widow's pension from Connie's uh, company's pension fund of £25,000 per annum. All net figures. Connie also owned two investment properties, and she managed them in her spare time. Bit of a superwoman, this lady. Um, and uh, she made a profit of about £5,000 per annum on each. That's after tax. Um, their plans were that they would have sold them when they retired to buy themselves a nice holiday home somewhere. Um, Edward became the sole owner of those properties on Connie's death, but he doesn't have the expertise that she had acquired over the years in managing them. He doesn't know, uh, he's not very good at that. So, working out multipliers, first thing to say, obviously, we're using the seventh edition of the Ogden tables uh, with the updated tables which give the multipliers at uh, the current discount rate of minus 2.5%. Uh, um, and um, they are available online at that address if you need them. Uh, we understand that the new eighth edition of the tables is imminent, um, although it seems from an online search to have been imminent for quite a while, and as usual, the government are treating personal injury as the lowest priority uh, that they have. So when that will actually come out remains to be seen, uh, but we will be aiming to provide some kind of early webinar or other training when the tables do come out. But for now we've got the seventh edition. 
So when we're looking at dependencies and multipliers and dependencies, the first thing to do is work out what the relevant life changes are in the, fu in the future had uh, Connie survived. Uh, first of all, of course, there's the possible promotion in two years' time. Um, then in, th in three years' time, Florence is expected to leave home when she reaches 21. That, however, is not going to affect the normal calculation of the multiplicand, so we're going to leave that out of the count. What will make a change is when Seth leaves home, and then the couple would have been, uh, they'd have flown the nest and the couple would have been uh, living on their own. That will change the multiplicand, as we'll see. Twelve years' time, they will retire. So we can see straight away that the multiplicand is going to change significantly at two years, six years, and 12 years from trial. So that's the first part of the uh, work we have to do. Second part, what's the start date for the multiplier? Until 2016, multipliers had to be calculated at the date of death. Uh, and in that year, the Supreme Court, in the case of now, had changed that rule. What we now do is calculate multipliers uh, from the trial, not from the date of death. So one needs to be uh, uh, beware of statements in textbooks uh, uh, prior to that date, and also the notes in the Ogden Table, seventh edition, because they are based on the old process of calculating multipliers at the date of death. Having said that, the present notes in the Ogden Tables do give guidance uh, in the event that the change that's now been made by Nower uh, is made. So uh, th th that's what I've based my um, assessment on. So next step, when does the dependency end? Well, uh, Edward is older than Connie, as said over, uh, they've got normal life expectancy. So obviously women generally living older than men to compensate them for the trials that men put them through earlier in life. Um, he would have predeceased her. So your starting point will be your life expectancy for Edward, which you take from table one, using a 0% discount rate, age 58, that's 27.78 years from the date of the trial. Now, calculating multipliers, and this is, the, this is perhaps the complicated bit. Um, you, the starting point is you're concerned with working life. Uh, and so therefore, you're going, until the period of retirement, you're going to work out uh, the multiplier uh, for Connie uh, up to the date of her retirement using table 10. Uh, so you can see here, I hope you can see the cursor um, on the screen. Uh, I'm taking a table 10 multiplier for Connie's working life to 65 when she would have retired. And that is uh, that figure there um, of 11.91 uh, from the Ogden tables. Now what we have to then do is because we've got various important life changes that happen uh, prior to retirement, we are going to have to split up the multiplier into three bits. The first bit uh, relates to the period leading up to the time when she might have received a promotion. The second bit, up to 2026, uh, relates to uh, the period uh, where um, uh, Seth is going to leave uh, home. And then the final bit uh, leads them up to uh, retirement. So we have to, in order to get uh, split multipliers that work for each period, we're gonna have to engage in a fairly involved process. The first thing we do, in each, each of those periods, you work out the number of years to the end of the period. So that's two years, six years, and 12 years respect, respectively. What we then do for each of those is to take a tre table 28 multiplier for that period. So 2.01 for two years, 6.05 for six years, 12.18 for 12 years. What we then do is split it up uh, using the following method. You take, for the first period, it's the same, it's 2.01. You then uh, take uh, the, the, the multiplier to 2026, which is 6.05, and deduct 2.01. That gives you 4.04. Uh, for then, and then for the final period, you take 12.18 and you deduct both those figures. And that gives you um, a figure of 6.13. Going on now to this column, what we do is we work out the percentage of each, the, the figure for each period of the, of the multiplier as a whole. So 2.01 divided by 12.18 gives you 16.5%. And then we repeat that process there. What we then do is split up the table 10 multiplier into those chunks. And that gives you an accurate multiplier uh, for each period. And you can see those there. So that's how we split up the working life multiplier. After retirement, it's more straightforward. There are no major changes expected between um, the, the time the couple retires 
and the time that, um, uh, that we're expect the husband's expected to pass away. Uh, so we're looking therefore for a table 28 multiplier for the life expectancy of Edward, which is 28.76. We then deduct uh, the table 10 multiplier from that, and that gives you the figure of 16.85. So that I hope is, uh, is, is, is clear as to how we work out uh, the multipliers. They then need adjustment. Uh, tables E and F are concepts in the Ogden tables and uh, they uh, take account of the possibility that the deceased might have died prior to the trial. So you need to apply a factor uh, to each multiplier to reflect that chance. Table E deals with past dependencies and uh, uh, for Connie, that with a three-year delay to trial, that gives a figure of 1.00. So in fact, we're not going to make a reduction at all. But in relation to future dependency, the figures are generally larger. Uh, in Connie's case, it's, it's hardly any reduction at all at 0.99. But the older your deceased is, and the longer the period to trial, the higher the factors are. They can become quite significant. So you must remember not to leave this step out. So, so much for multipliers. What about multiplicands? Well, we have here a case where both the deceased and, and uh, their partner had income. So um, the usual formula that one uses is that from Cowden Comex, which is a unreported Court of Appeal decision from 1988. And the formula is there. You add the defendant's, uh, the deceased's income to the a partner's income. You then multiply that by a factor and then you deduct um, the uh, uh, partner's income from that again. So the factor F is 0.75 where there are dependent children because obviously children are expensive as I'm sure many of you will know uh, and uh, 0.66 where there are no dependent children. The theory being that, in, that uh, when there are no dependent children uh, the deceased would have spent more income, more of their income just on themselves. Now this of course is not an invariable rule. Um, if you've got, for example, someone who's a workaholic and hardly spent any money on themselves at all, uh, then you can argue for a higher factor. You're obviously going to have to reduce evidence about that. But an example of where that was done was in the Williams case from 2008, where Mr. Williams was a workaholic uh, and it was held that he would only have spent about 12.5% of his income on himself. And um, uh, therefore, the factor that was used was 87.5%. So some points of difficulty that arise from our case. First of all, how to deal with contingencies about uh, the couple's income. Uh, how to deal with Connie's income from the properties. Uh, what about the income that Edward now has as a consultant? How is that to be dealt with? And, and fourthly, uh, how to deal with the widower's pension, which Edward is now entitled to. So income contingencies, just as with a living claimant, it's never certain that the deceased would definitely have worked in the same role for the rest of their life. People get ill, people get fed up, and there are always chances uh, that people may decide to leave the workplace or be forced out of the workplace for whatever reason. So it's necessary to discount uh, our income figures for contingencies. You can use tables, tables A to D in the Ogden tables as a starting point for this. Uh, in Connie's case, however, uh, because she's highly, highly regarded employee and she's working for a prosperous company, uh, we're going to use a discount of 10% in her case. Edward is working, however, for a charity. He's probably more vulnerable uh, and therefore we'd apply a discount of 25% for him. How to deal with Connie's income from her properties? Well, here, uh, one has to apply an analysis uh, in the case of Wood from 1992, a decision of the Court of Appeal. Um, also, uh, it's been applied a number of cases, including the uh, Williams case that I mentioned in an earlier slide. And the rule is that where dependents inherit an income producing asset from the deceased, the income from the asset does not form part of the dependency. The reason being that the, that the dependents have now acquired the asset and therefore uh, there is no loss to them uh, when uh, the asset is inherited. However, there are many cases where the deceased applied their time and skill to producing that income from that asset. And therefore, there may instead be a claim for the cost of replacing that time and skill. 
I'm going to include that in the income dependency, although uh, logically you could also include, say it's more, it's more likely to be uh, regarded as a services dependency. It doesn't matter where you put it in, uh, you can put it in under either heading for your analysis as long as you uh, remember it goes in somewhere. So what about this case? So uh, Edward cannot claim the income from the property as part of his dependency because he's, he's now entitled to receive uh, the rent from that property. But, but because he can't do the job himself, he's not very good at it, um, it's reasonable for him to hire an agent to replace the services uh, that Connie, um, uh, that, that, that Connie um, provided formerly. Uh, so uh, the re resulting reduction in the profit, say perhaps £2,000 per annum on each property, um, you uh, can then claim um, as a uh, part of Edward's dependency. Somebody has just raised their hand. Can I uh, ask somebody to put a question or any point they want to make um, in the chat? Thank you very much for that. In the uh, question and answer section, rather. So uh, what about Edward's consultancy income? Uh, the multiplicand uh, is fixed at death uh, in general terms. Uh, the question is generally, uh, what would have happened uh, had, uh, if the deceased had lived? The question is not, what has happened as a result of the deceased's death? So unless you can say that Edward would have started his consultancy work even if Connie had lived, his income is now ignored um, under Section 4 of the uh, Fatal Accidents Act. Um, if, however, the dependent, uh, dependent dies before trial or becomes terminally ill, uh, that can be taken into account in calculating uh, the multiple can in the future. Edward's widower's pension, uh, under the Fatal Accidents Act, benefits received are ignored, so he is not required to give credit for the widower's pension that he has or will receive. Uh, in that sense, therefore, Edward is in fact better off. So, uh, with all that in mind, we can now pass to calculate uh, the figures uh, for, uh, for dependency. So what we have here is we've got Connie's gross income as a manager, we discount that by 90%, uh, to 40, uh, that's £14,500, add in her income from her property, so she's got a total income of 44500 discount Edward's income to give 18750 and here we are, uh, that's the coward factor, that's the figure that comes out of the coward formula, um, table E, we're, we're not uh, doing any adjustment there. Three years worth, uh, so that times three is that. Uh, and that's the past dependency to which obviously you'll apply interest. Future dependency. Uh, first, the first chunk of it uh, very, is, is that exactly the same calculation because there have been no life changes then. Only difference is you're going to apply table F and you're going to apply the multiplier for the first chunk of 1.97 and that's the figure that pops out. Now, moving on to the next uh, phase, uh, at this stage, uh, Connie uh, has a 75% chance of being promoted to director. She would have had additional income, not the uh, additional income of £30,000 over and above her manager's salary. In working out the discount, we discount that for 25% for the chance she wouldn't have been promoted. Um, and we uh, then apply the 90% discount, the 10% the, um, discount that we were applying anyway. So there's addition, an additional income figure to be factored in there of 20,000 odd pounds, which we put there. Uh, so she's now gone up to a total dependency figure, value of dependency of 64,000 odd pounds. Edward's at the same level. So we recalculate the multiple can, which is now higher. Apply table F, apply the multiplier, and this chunk of dependency is very substantial, 171,000 odd pounds. Next phase, um, by this stage, Seth has left home. Uh, so we've got the same figures for income, uh, which are there, but now we're using the coward factor of two thirds. Um, and that produces therefore a lower multiple can, um, uh, because um, Connie's in, Connie would have spent more of her income on herself, it's uh, what we're assuming. Table F and multiplier then gives a dependency figure for this period of 144,000 pounds. And then finally, we've got retirement. Um, uh, we look at Connie's pension figures, £25,000 net um, from her manager's post. She would have had an additional £15,000 per annum 
if she got to direct her. So you apply the same discount rates there. And that, that gives a dependency of, uh, that gives a figure of 32,625 pounds. Uh, Edward would have had a higher pension from his former employment, which we know he's going to receive. Uh, so that's 50,000 pounds taken into account. Applying the coward factor and, and, and the much lower multiplicand and the retirement multiplier in table F, that then gives you uh, the dependency for the retirement of 84,000 odd pounds. And there are your totals. Um, the, the future total is over a half a million pounds. Uh, so you can see there that that all um, adds up quite nicely in terms of your claim. Uh, so that's my bit of it. Happy to take any questions. And I'm, I'll try and, um, uh, I'll, I'll try and uh, deal with any answers in the chat while Lisa is speaking. Uh, but I'm now going to hand you over to her. So uh, over to you, uh, Lisa. Lovely. Uh, thank you, Paul. I've just unmuted myself. Let me see if I can um, share my screen with you all. Is that now showing? I think it should be. Somebody tell me if it isn't. So I'm going to deal with services dependency. Um, Paul has very kindly taken the difficult task of making multipliers sound simple. Um, and so I'm going to be looking at the different factual scenarios that can throw themselves up in service dependency claims and how you might approach them. Um, and I start by saying that there is no one size fits all for this type of calculation. And really, um, there's a lot of hard work to be done in gathering the facts in each particular case, because that will dictate how you approach it. Um, I've often found in dealing with future services dependency claims um, that you might actually find that you have two or three ways of, of pleading it and framing it. Um, and you've just got to um, uh, keep digging in the facts to see which is, is the best way to plead it in the particular case. Okay. Right, I've shared my screen and I can't seem to move it on, so just bear with me. Um, there we go. Um, okay, so I'm going to provide some practical examples. Um, I've started here by using services as a mother or a father. Um, it's quite typical when you're doing the Fatal Accident Act cases to come across the services provided by a lost mother or father. Um, sometimes you will come across um, the services that were provided by a spouse. But it's not limited to that, so do remember when you're speaking with a client to um, ask questions that are quite far reaching. Um, sometimes you have services that are provided by a sibling. Um, sometimes you provide, uh, there is a um, a younger member of the family that's deceased that would have provided services to grandparents, for instance, um, aunts and uncles. And whilst that's less common, um, you should still explore those facts. But the first couple of examples will look at the most common, which is the services of a mother and a father. Um, so I've taken an example here of um, a, a deceased mother, wife um, and wife aged 45 at the time of her death, children aged two, five and seven, and how we might approach that. I've set out just a summary of the facts. She drove the children to school um, and to all of their various clubs. She made all of their meals and she helped with their schoolwork. The seven-year-old had mild learning disabilities and she spent additional time supporting him with schoolwork, prompting and planning. So how might you approach this? Um, well, your fact finding, first of all, um, what services was the deceased, I've said there, C, that should be deceased, what services was the deceased providing um, prior to her death and how long was being spent on each task? Um, you might want to break this down like you would approaching a traditional past care claim in terms of um, searching the facts. Um, what tasks were done in the morning, what tasks were done after school, how is that broken down? Um, and then look at potentially what is being done since the time of death. So have, has the father employed care since then? Um, has he taken time off to provide care? Um, have other members of the family that live close by um, stepped in to provide and assist with gratuitous care? So look at that situation. Um, whatever's been happening since the death, isn't necessarily the answer. What you might find is that they're coping in that time, um, but they actually need, say, commercial services to step in. And um, so you explore the facts, um, but look at, at what is going to um, best provide the services that the deceased mother was providing prior to her death. 
Um, also ask questions about what was envisaged in the future. It could be that this was a mother that had worked before she had her first child and she always envisaged going back to work. So you'll want to explore that because it will make a difference uh, to the stages of calculation going forward on the future dependency. Um, and what extra hours were spent um, assisting the eldest child, um, who you'll recall had mild learning disabilities. So presumably mother would assist all children at some stage with schoolwork, but were additional hours being spent? And what was the nature of that? Was it additional teaching? Was it taking that child to a tutor, for instance? Because you'll want to take account of those hours. Um, and uh, with me. So how might we approach this? You'll see through the case law um, with uh, the care of or services provided by a mother or father with regard to children, younger children, that when they reach school age or the youngest child reach, reaches full time school age, that you will see a tapering off of the awards which are made. And so very often the starting position is the commercial cost of the replacement of that service provided by the deceased mother or father. So you might start with a, a claim for um, a nanny, for instance, so that father can continue working. Um, you will get the uh, annual costs of nanny care within facts and figures for a given year, but these are very um, broad figures. Uh, you can use them if you wish, but you might also want to get some more um, local figures. It could be that they have a nanny already in place and you want to use the figures that are already um, being charged. Um, so, so bear in mind that you want more, you may want more specific evidence if the nanny is not already in place and something more specific than that which is in facts and figures. And um, we often see age six for um, once they're fully established in full time uh, schooling as being the point at which it will start to taper. So, of course, in this case, it would be um, age six of the youngest child. And it could be that the mother would uh, have returned to work at, at that point. What you see at that age is um, if, if father is going to keep the nanny on, you might just see a tapering or a discount of that nanny cost or you might see the cost convert from the cost of an, a commercial nanny to say a housekeeper or that which we see sometimes referred to as mother's help or indeed father's help, which is um, providing uh, preschool um, care or, or after school care, for instance. You'll also want to explore the cost of the potentially a tutor, for instance, depending upon the nature of the learning disability of the seven year old child um, and how will that develop over time and the nature of the service that the deceased mother was providing to that child, you may be able to claim um, for uh, the, the cost of a tutor, for instance, um, for some hours in the week until that child reaches a certain age. And I've said at the bottom of this screen just very briefly about multipliers. Paul's dealt with that um, in some detail and, and it doesn't form the um, subject matter of the uh, of my slides. Uh, but usually when you're dealing with um, the claim for the services provided by a mother or father, it's up until the child is, say, aged 18, unless there is specific evidence that they are going to stay on in the home for a little bit longer. Potentially, they'll be in education longer. Um, it, it depends on the facts of your case. But in those circumstances, you'll gen generally be dealing with um, a term certain rather than a lifetime multiplier. Um, and you will have different multiplicands depending upon the tapering of, um, of the costs during that term certain. Um, and of course, as Paul highlighted, you will want to make a discount for contingencies and it will be future, so you'll be dealing with table F. Um, uh, with me. Um, another common dependency claim that we see for services is that of a spouse. Um, so taking um, the, the simplest, if you like, where you've got a married, child, married couple, they've got adult children who are not dependent on them in any way, they're living their own lives. Um, husband has died aged 64, leaving his wife who still worked, he was semi-retired at the time of his death. Uh, the deceased undertook DIY, decorating, gardening, food, shopping and cooking. Marvellous. Um, now, he one way of approaching this is to um, is to break down the um, the various uh, types of services that he was providing but you don't have to approach each one in the same way so for instance gardening um, if the um, if the claimant wife 
is not going to take over that task. Your starting point is the commercial value. Again, you'll find those figures in facts and figures. Just a word of warning, when you look at facts and figures for, say, gardeners' costs and the typical hourly cost, again, it varies from region to region, but also it's the, it's the kind of flat rate for somebody who's going to come and mow your lawn and do a little bit of work. If, if your client has two acres to maintain and beautiful borders and um, it's really quite specialist care, then you've got good evidence to have a higher rate than that and you'll want to get some evidence in relation to it, some quotes, or it could be that the claimant um, already has professionals coming in to assist with it. Um, so as I say, it's not always a one size fits all. Um, DIY and decorating, again, it depends upon the uh, facts of your case and how much time uh, the deceased was spending um, on this type of work. If you've got somebody that was a joiner by trade and did all of the work around the house, then you're going to have a higher multiplicand. Sometimes the court's approach of um, a... Um, a partner's assistance around the home with DIY and decorating is to say that it might just be a bit of wallpapering every few years, in which case the court might not take and multiply a multiple planned approach. And you can choose not to do that in your schedule or counter schedule. You can just award a lump sum and you might um, or claim a lump sum and you might decide to do that if they are older in age and there's fewer years to think about and this is their final home. Um, or if the work is potentially really sporadic and you just want to put a global figure on it. So that's another way of approaching it. Um, and I, I covered there just before I changed the screen, um, shopping and cooking, for instance. Um, let's say the, um, the uh, claimant wife is going to do that work herself. Ordinarily, and I'll come on to this, then you would look at the um, hours spent and take the commercial rate um, for the cost of those services and discount it by, say, 25% to reflect the fact um, that that commercial rate includes things for things like tax and national insurance. But I will come on to comment about a more recent case dealing with that discount in a moment. Um, another example of services of a spouse and why it is useful to uh, recognise that it isn't always one size fits all and to take different approaches to calculations you might have a situation where the deceased was the sole carer for the surviving spouse. Um, so here I've given the example of a married couple, no children or wider family, um, wife deceased age 61, she's leaving her husband and her husband has um, a, quite a severe illness which limits his walking distance. She's his primary carer and essentially runs the household and does all of the chores and personal care for him. So how might you approach this? Well, you can, um, there's no family around, so it's likely to be commercial care and that care is probably going to have been needed since the point of death. And so one would hope that there's already a regime in place that you can use as the multiple account. Um, but um, it, it's worth thinking about how you actually claim for that and as a defendant to think about what might be awarded. I've used the case of um, Sloan and Haslan here. That's an unreported case, uh, but you will find the summary on Lawtel and it's the summary of a settlement. Um, but it's just a useful reminder that in that case, the, claim, uh, the claimant claimed for the cost of um, a case manager. Um, because to um, support the care regime uh, and support the um, surviving spouse and it was awarded uh, for the care and case manager as a periodical payments. Now we don't see that too often because they will only be um, claimed and awarded in certain types of cases um, and this scenario being the perfect type of example where there's no other family around and there is a need for daily professional care um, and you're likely to have expert evidence on the point. What about future dependency? Um, so uh, this is loosely based on an example of a case I've had. Um, so we've got the deceased that died at age 20. Uh, he had no dependence at the time of his death. He had one sibling with learning difficulties um, who requires daily support with planning and prompting and financial support. It's what some people, um, care reports would refer to as light touch support, but very, um, very much needed and necessary. At the time of his death, his parents were providing that support um, to the sibling. Um, and what you need to explore with your client is what was anticipated for the future. Um, 
was there ever a discussion as to whether the um, deceased would have stepped in and performed this role? Was it even possible? Um, I, I remember in this case, the deceased was away at university in a different city. Would they have returned to the local city of the sibling so to, as to be able to provide that prompting, planning and support? Now, all of this raises interesting questions um, as to um, the how best to approach the calculation because what the courts may do is um, apply a discount for the future contingency that this might not happen at all um, and so you'll see it with some cases where um, there are service dependencies um, which are claimed which might not occur and the court might apply a discount of say 40 percent to that to account for that risk because as you know for the future dependency to arise you don't have to establish it on the balance of probabilities and then you get the full 100%. You look at if it's more than fanciful, then there is a claim there and the court looks at the likelihood of that occurring and applies a discount where necessary. Um, so what you might find is that you would have a discount, you, you take your multiple account um, and look at your term certain for the future um, and then discount that for contingencies relating to death, but then there is an overall discount relating to the contingency that the care might not be provided at all. Um, questions that you might ask the client in that scenario is uh, the hours spent by the parents now, what is the position of the sibling in the future, um, the prompting and planning, will that be required at the same level um, for the duration of her lifetime? What about the prospect of the sister marrying in the future and her partner providing this type of support? Might that increase the discount that the court might apply for the future contingency that this might not happen at all? Um, and then I've uh, set out there what you would do with your um, uh, multiplier and multiplicand and again make sure you make the discount for table F. Um, some cases that I just wanted to raise with you, um, what I would say is if you are, have signed into this uh, webinar because you're quite new to Fatal Accident Act cases or you don't do many of them, um, it can be quite difficult initially to get a feel for the pulse of how these cases will be determined and sometimes there can be quite a broad range which makes it really quite difficult to advise as to what the likely outcome will be in terms of the value of the claim. And what I would say is um, read around, speak to colleagues about their cases, look at the um, look at the um, actual case reports and the approach taken by courts in terms of the calculation. So don't just read the chapter on Kemp or, or in facts and figures. Go and look at the cases and the way that the courts have approached um, the breaking down of the calculation. And I've put some examples in here which are quite interesting. A, B and K, L, 2019 High Court decision. Uh, this was a decision um, relating to, it's interesting to the fact that it was three brothers um, lost their father. Um, the claimant was the eldest of the siblings um, who was an adult and the other two siblings were twins, I believe, they were 15. And they made claims for um, the future cost of um, uh, contributions to their weddings and contributions to their first house. Um, and you recall I spoke earlier about a potential discount for future contingencies. Um, what the court determined in that case is that it was more than fanciful that the father would have um, uh, provided a contribution um, to the costs of weddings and houses um, in the future. Um, looking at the facts of each case, the eldest um, son was in a relationship for, uh, I think, over a decade with his current partner, and so a wedding was like likely to be happen, but not certain. Um, and the younger um, uh, siblings, I think, I think it was a 40% discount was applied to the um, eldest sibling, and, and a greater discount was applied to the younger siblings because it was a um, there was more time between the uh, date of trial and the prospect of their them getting married and so greater the contingencies and so they, a greater discount was applied but it's worth looking at that to see the approach taken um forgive me i've gone back um with and steve hill i think we had a uh, question about this case from i believe it was natalie hurst um, so this is a case in which um, it deals with the 25 to 33% discount that is traditionally applied to um, services dependency where care is provided gratuitously. Um, now, in this case, the, um, the 
the court relied upon uh, and accepted there was expert evidence on both sides about the care that would be provided so the uh, deceased uh, and and his wife were foster carers the um, husband had um, left work in order for the wife to return to nursing i believe it was um, and after his death, she decided that she would be at home to care for the foster children who um, I believe uh, they were on the um, autistic spectrum. And there was expert evidence as to the care that they would require, but she would be providing it gratuitously. Um, and it was contended that that should be discounted well, there were two points made. Firstly, that the uh, claimant's expert had inflated the figures and, and they were over-egged, as it were. Um, and secondly, that it should be discounted by the 25 to 33 percent range that we usually see. Um, and the court rejected both arguments. First of all, the judge accepted entirely the claimant's expert evidence with regard to rate, but then declined to make the discount. And there is a question mark as to what extent now um, that 25 to 33% discount will be applied in the future. I suspect with them is probably different because it was the subject of expert evidence and the primary finding was that he was accepting that case, the expert's evidence as to the cost of the future care. Um, and uh, in these cases, you often see judges trying to do justice. And whilst the loss of earnings of the mother wasn't used as the um, kind of proxy figure for the care provided, um, I think in those circumstances uh, that there was, there was, it, it was fair not to make a discount. But the extent to which this argument will run in the future remains to be seen. I suspect that where you have, for instance, the um, typical services dependence claim, I used the example earlier of um, uh, dependency provided, um, services provided by a spouse of say cooking and cleaning or a bit of DIY and that then is going to be performed gratuitously and it's very low level, I can see that there are still going to be arguments for the discount to be applied because the commercial rate includes these enhancements of national insurance and tax that simply aren't going to apply. But when looks, one looks at the reasoning in Witham, um, it's got a strong argument for claimants um, to, to run with that reasoning um, and, and claim the whole lot and see what comes out in negotiation. Um, Sloan and Haslan I've mentioned, which is to bear in mind that you can claim periodical payments in the appropriate type of case. Um, the West Hertfordshire case that I've included at the bottom, if you're going to read with them, you'll probably be referred to the West Hertfordshire case because um, looking at it from a slightly different angle, but this deals with the scenario where you have a um, claimant uh, parent who has had to leave work because of a leave or change work because um, their deceased partner used to provide the care. Now, um, in the West Hertfordshire case, the, the claimant was a, a doctor um, practicing in England and with no family around and decided to move back to, um, I think it was Sri Lanka, um, in order for um, in order for her to access the gratuitous care because that's where her family were. Um, now there was a settlement um, of the gratuitous and commercial element of the care that she would access. Um, but what she also claimed was her loss of earnings for needing to move um, in order to access this care. And, and the court quite rightly found that you can't have an independent loss of earnings claim arising um, under the Fatal Accidents Act. It, it is there to compensate the dependency that was present prior to the death. Um, and so in, in that case, it, it was rejected. You do see some cases where the loss of earnings is used as the um, as a, a comparative value to the uh, cost of care, but that's usually in circumstances where the court has taken into account reasonableness and where, for instance, the uh, surviving spouse parent is, um, is uh, the loss of earnings are comparable to the commercial element of the, uh, to the commercial cost of the care. So there's some uh, interesting cases to keep in mind. Um, those are the ends of, uh, end of my slides and I will look to see if we have any questions. What, what I've done, Lisa, while you've been speaking is I've attempted to answer um, some of the questions. If everyone wants to open the question and answer tab, um, we can perhaps just have a quick look at some of the questions that we have uh, that we've dealt with.
Um, first of all, um, Sarah asked us the question, uh, can, you, can you argue that it makes a lot of a difference when you have lots of children rather than just one, as Sarah does? Um, and uh, the answer to that really is, uh, obviously, if you, have a, uh, if you have an exceptionally large family, um, uh, then uh, obviously a parent's uh, likely to have very little to spend on themselves. And that's obviously particularly so if their income is modest. So in such a case, you could well say uh, that there should only be a very modest discount indeed um, for, the, uh, for, the, for what the deceased would have spent on themselves. Um, question from um, uh, Emily, or I'm not sure it's Emily or Rosa, because we also had a message from Rosa, but uh, uh, she's raised there, um, uh, the, 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 which, she raises an important point, because there seems to be a common misconception uh, that if the surviving spouse was earning more than the uh, deceased, um, that, the, uh, that the, there's no income dependency. And that is not correct. If you do the maths, as, I, as, as I've done in the discussion below, if you're using, if, if, if you're uh, with children and you're using a 75% discount, um, then what you'll find is that unless the deceased's income is, sorry, the, claim, the claimant's income is at least three times higher uh, than the deceased's income, you will get, still get a dependency figure, albeit it may be quite a small one. Uh, so that's an important point to bear in mind. And uh, there's an interesting discussion that we've uh, subsequently had there, which you can see. Um, Paul, I'm not sure if your firm is running a sweepstake as to how long I was going to be. Uh, if you've won, <laughs> congratulations. Uh, and then, Lisa, this is probably one for you from Marcus. Uh, do you want to have okay. a look at that? Yeah, I'll, I'll take a little look at it. Ha have a look at that. While you're doing that, what I'm going to do is I'm, is I'm going to... Um, open up my uh, screen share again, if I can work out how to do that. Um, right, I'm going to go, what I've done is, uh, we had a couple of questions before, uh, b b before the seminar. So what I'm going to do is just perhaps uh, d deal, with, uh, deal with those. Uh, can everyone now see on screen uh, a question from Natalie at, Bar at Moore Barlow? So, um, just go, going, we'll just go back to Lucy's question first. Lucy from Forbes Solicitors. She, she said, we'd be interested to know how you approach dependency where the deceased and wider family have no history of sustained employment. Uh, what I'd suggest here is that you've got to consider this in a similar way to a living claimant. Uh, you consider, uh, first of all, whether you can justify a heavily discounted multiplier multiplicand calculation, paying that a lump sum Blamire type award. Also bear in mind that social security benefits can form the, the subject of an income dependency. Um, so uh, you may need to get uh, the claimant's DWP records, the deceased DWP records, uh, and see um, how uh, that, uh, whether there's any source of dependency there as well. Uh, moving on, uh, Natalie uh, asked us uh, this question about funeral expenses, which we haven't gone through in detail but often is a, a point of real sensitivity with families. And this is a, this is a very valid and very important question about cultural traditions and uh, example given of a, of a deceased from Africa uh, where, there are, where there's a, a cultural tradition as to how the funeral takes place and a lot of money spent on uh, the funeral uh, carrying out those various activities. So my answer is this. Um, Funeral expenses uh, have never, as far as I can see, been the subject of any authoritative decision of the courts. There's quite a useful discussion in the textbook McGregor on damages, which I recommend people look at. In relation to Natalie's question, there is a decision called St George from 2003, uh, where £50,000 was allowed for funeral expenses. It was a rather extraordinary case. The deceased was Japanese and the defendant was her husband who had murdered her. Um, and uh, the, full, uh, uh, the full cost of a Buddhist funeral with monks in attendance, a family altar in Japan, a Memorial Day and an anniversary reception was allowed. Now, uh, is that the right approach? It seems to go uh, considerably beyond what other decisions have allowed. And you'll see that McGregor is critical of that decision. I think a more liberal approach should be taken to funeral expenses, uh, but that doesn't seem to be the way the courts are approaching it. The recent case of Blake against Mad Max and uh, affirm that the costs of funeral receptions or wakes are not generally recoverable. My personal view is that the courts are taking too narrow a view to this, uh, but uh, we'll have to wait to see whether anybody actually decides they feel strongly enough to take it to a higher level before we get some authoritative um, uh, guidance. 
So uh, those are the two questions we had beforehand. Lisa, uh, do you want to add anything to what I've said in response to Marcus? Yeah, I was just I was just writing a reply actually. Um, so the, the the service dependency arises from the fact that the services were being provided prior to the death, and the claimant is entitled to the um, the cost of replacement of those services regardless. And so I would say quite firm against any arguments that just because they haven't employed somebody in the meantime, that they're either a not entitled to um, uh, uh, the claim at all or that they're not going to employ somebody in the future. I mean, after somebody has died, you will quite often see um, claimants that have a, a state of flux um, to decide how they're going to live their lives thereafter. But that doesn't prevent them from being able to make the claim for the services that they were, if they can prove, as a matter of fact, they were dependent on them prior to the um, death that they're entitled to. Um, I agree with Paul that lack of funds does come up quite a lot and that can be one of the reasons, but sometimes it can be just that they are um, against bringing people into their home for a period of time that may subsist for a period even after the, um, after the claim is settled or after the trial, um, but they're still entitled to the service um, for the, um, uh, for the uh, duration if they were entitled if, if they were reliant upon the service beforehand. Um, I, I don't know, Marcus, whether in your example they've got nobody providing gratuitous care um, in, the, in the interim period um, or nobody available to do that, and so commercial um, care is the only option. Um, but uh, I, I, I would stay firm on those arguments that they're entitled to it for the full period because it's the measure of the service that they've lost. Thank you, Lisa. We've got um, a couple of more questions that have come in. Um, if, uh, if, if I deal with Peter's question, perhaps you can address Anna's question, uh, Lisa. Okay. Uh, she was asked about uh, probate fees. Uh, this, it seems to me, uh, is, not a recoverable, uh, is, is not recoverable, even on the widest possible view of funeral expenses. Uh, what you can do, as it seems to, uh, it, it may well be, however, if you would not have taken out a grant of probate uh, unless there was a claim, uh, that could po possibly form an item of recoverable costs. Uh, I've not given that any real thought, and I couldn't say whether or not that would be sound, but maybe talk to a cost lawyer about it. But I am quite clear that it seems to me that you can't recover uh, probate fees as damages uh, in a fatal accidents claim. Lisa, over to you. Uh, so sorry, I'm looking at Anna's question, the loss of childcare services. So it says this, the loss of childcare services when calculating the date of childcare reduces when the child goes to school. Do you only calculate to when the youngest existing child starts school or do you consider any plans there were for, um, for any future children? Um, so um, you take it to the point at which the youngest child is going to school. Um, so the, the thing about dependency claims is it crystallises at the point of death. Um, so and you don't take into account any potential future dependents. The, the dependents are the dependents that were dependent at the time of the death. So if there were two children, even if there'd been a plan for a third child, that hasn't crystallised at the point of death. And so you would start to taper it at the point that the youngest child goes to school. I hope that answers it. Great. Uh, have we got any more? Sorry, I've just lost my... Uh... Have we, have we, is there anything else that's been added, Lisa? I, I have, I've, I've just lost my. Um, did we deal with? Um, did we deal with Ben's? Is that Ben's? Uh, we, just haven't, been... we haven't dealt with. Um, we, we haven't dealt with um, Ben's. No, let's just have a look at that. So he's talking about um, extended family in Sri Lanka. Multiple trips to visit parents sends money to them. Right. So. Um, okay. Just trying to uh, understand um, the the issue here. Um, so the parent sends the the money to family in Sri Lanka. Does the partner get the trips factored in? Well, you'd have to be careful not to double count income, wouldn't you? Um, because if you if you are if if if, if those uh, if those trips are being paid for out of the family's income. Um, then uh, you uh, then that you've already taken that into account in your equation. 
So if you are then seeking to add the co add the value of the trips on top of that, because those are paid out of the deceased income, it seems to me that you're double counting. Uh, would you agree with that, Lisa? That seems to me. To I, I would. It's a question of the, of the facts in the case, and so if, um, as Paul says, if it's taken into account on the income, then you can't use it again. But you might have a scenario where you've actually got adult children. Um, and parents who are quite wealthy and pay for, say, an annual trip for the whole family, and they're dependent upon that. Um, and so they, they don't live within the same household, and so they're not getting the benefit from the household income, but they are getting this benefit of a holiday, say, every one, two, three years. Um, and if, they, if you can prove that dependency and that the parent would have carried on to provide that um, that benefit to them, um, then then I can see you have a claim. But as Paul says, you need to be cautious that the dependent is not within the household benefiting from the household income and that it is encompassed as part of that. Right. Um, we, we're out of questions. Uh, so what I think we'll do is uh, we'll, uh, we'll perhaps finish there. Um, we are always, of course, very happy to be contacted um, with uh, uh, by anybody uh, who has queries or wants uh, uh, wants to discuss any particular case uh, and the slides will be available on our website um, and also you'll be able to see this again if you regard this as being so compelling that uh, you want to see it again and again uh, please uh, visit Run Transfer Lane's YouTube channel where you'll see all the webinars that we've started doing during lockdown uh, and both Lisa and I hope very much that you found this a useful exercise um, I'm going to add the questions that we've had uh, to uh, the slides, to my slides, uh, so that you'll be able to see the, um, the written answers that we've given after the uh, seminar's over. Thank you very much indeed, everybody, for attending, and we hope very much that you found it useful. Thank you.